Hey everybody, this is Alan Evora with Affinity Energy. Thanks for joining me today. Today we're going to talk about automating the testing and reporting of emergency power supply systems. This is something that we're seeing a lot more demand for within the healthcare industry and I believe it's an important topic to be discussed because not only does automating the testing and reporting reduce the amount of resources required to conduct the test, it also provides us with some insights into possible predictive maintenance that we might need to perform on these systems. So why don't we jump on in? So today's webinar is automating the testing and reporting of emergency power supply systems. So a little bit about Affinity Energy. We're a specialty systems integrator that's been focused on mission critical power applications. We specifically look to address some of the challenges within healthcare and data centers and manufacturing. We've been in business for over 15 years and we are a Schneider Electric eco expert in the critical power space. Uh, with respect to uh, an eco expert, that means that we maintain expertise within uh, submetering, within the Schneider Electric product lines, also within uh, EPMS, electrical power management systems, which includes power monitoring expert, as well as power SCADA operations should you require more detailed control of your electrical power management system. To start out with, let's go over what comprises an emergency power supply system. The current slide details a typical electrical distribution within a hospital. As you can see, you, you have um, your primary electrical service main, which is grayed out, and then you have your emergency power supply, which typically is composed of one or more generators along with some electrical switch gear and some automatic transfer switches to switch between normal and emergency power based on the availability of normal power. So why is testing important? Well, statistics have shown that since 1984, power outages have increased at least 265%. So outages are on the rise. That means the need for emergency power certainly is on the rise. Also, what's been found is that one in five generators, when called to start, fails to start for numerous reasons. But certainly, um, it has prompted the need for regular testing. And also, what you'll see as we move forward within this webinar, that automating that testing can also help mitigate the potential that your generator will fail to start. A little bit of review of codes and standards because they're the drivers behind why a customer is actually being asked or required to perform regular testing of their emergency power supply system. The, most, um, the codes that are most relevant when it comes to the emergency power supply system are the NFPA or the National Fire Protection Agency codes and the relevant codes are code 70, code 99, and code 110. For the purposes of this webinar, NFPA 110 is the primary focus, which is the standard for emergency and standby power systems. Now these codes are typically enforced by different agencies, like the Joint Commission, which is also referred to as JCO, which stands for the Joint Commission for the Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, but you can also have other authorities having jurisdiction, or AHJs, as well as state and local agencies, which may be playing a part with respect to compliance with emergency and standby power system testing. One thing to note with respect to the type of testing and the type of automation required with respect to your EPSS system is NFPA 110 distinguishes between two levels of systems, what are referred to as level one and level two. Level one is referred to a system that its failure could result in a loss of life or serious injury. While level two is obviously other systems that whose failure may not be critical to human life and or safety. 
The focus of this particular presentation is going to be really on level one, which requires regular testing or a substantial level of testing that's much greater than that of level two. Not to say that the benefit of this uh, webinar is going to be less with respect to level two systems, but certainly our experience has been that customers who have requirements to meet level one have the greatest value benefit from an automated testing and reporting system. Just a quick uh, overview of the guidelines. I'm not going to go through each of these in great detail. You can review them on the slide. But some of the key um, standards that are important to note are, number one, testing has to be done on a regular basis, at least 12 times a year, with no sooner than 20 days or no more than 40 days between tests. The tests have to be done under load and for a certain duration. So the tests need to be done uh, at 30% of the nameplate of the generator and they have to be conducted over 30 minutes. Another important thing to note is not only do the generators need to be tested, but the automatic transfer switch also needs to be exercised on a regular basis. Again, no sooner than 20 days or no more than 40 days and 12 times throughout the year. Again, uh, important and highlighted on this slide is that there needs to be a written record of the any testing, the performance, and any inspections related to the emergency power supply system. This slide highlights, again, the suggested operation and testing procedures for your EPSS system as taken from the NFPA 110 standard. If you pay close attention to this and as underlined in this slide, you'll see that there are many times in the recommended procedure where recording of the test results or the test procedure is required. So again, having a means by which this recording can be done in an automated fashion can result in both a more accurate test and also it allows the operators to focus on other um, areas during the test, perhaps using their sight, their hearing, their senses to make sure that other things during the test are operating properly and don't require some attention post-test. So how do you test your EPSS system? Our experience has been that a majority of owners are primarily using manual means for testing. They're using stopwatches and clipboards in order to record the results of the tests. And we're finding that more and more owners, as a result of A, more complicated systems, B, uh, less resources to conduct the tests, and C, more requirements required during the tests are looking at automated means in order to capture all the information and not only record the test, but also have a way to validate the results of the test um, and doing that in a very timely manner. Just a couple reasons why um, manual recording may be something that um, really needs to be questioned within your organization. Number one, we're finding that um, doing it manually, again, considering that there's a lot of activities going on, can be difficult. Um, it can present some challenges with terms of accuracy and also uh, timing. And so having a means that which the recording can be done on an automated basis and you'll have a much more precise record of the test instill some confidence not only within the compliance bodies such as your AHJs or your uh, different organizations such as JCO, but also within your management. It instills confidence that these tests are being conducted and the results of the tests are being recorded accurately. Additionally, um, as mentioned earlier, it allows the operators to shift their focus not so much to the results themselves or the timing of the test, but use their uh, senses to detect whether there could be other issues. Perhaps they could visually detect that there's more smoke 
in the exhaust, which could be an indicator of wet stacking. Maybe they're able to uh, view the, the sound that's occurring during the generator test to see if there's something abnormal about the decibel level that's occurring during the test. Maybe they're able to view some of the other non-required parameters that are um, recorded by the generator uh, control panel during the test in order to determine whether there could be other potential preventative maintenance that needs to be performed on the generator. Another good benefit of automated testing and reporting is that data can automatically be transferred to the PC, not just to validate the test, but also for trend analysis. This can allow you to look at, again, whether the exhaust gas temperature is starting to uh, trend lower, indicating that wet stacking could be occurring. You could also be trending the time that it takes in order for the generator to be at voltage. So again, is it taking longer to meet the 10 second requirement in order to have emergency power supply system online? Or perhaps even just looking at how the starter battery's performance is doing. Perhaps there could be a potential problem with the charger. So again, having all of that information being recorded in the background serves not only uh, a purpose of showing that you've passed your test, but also allowing you to be smarter about maintaining and operating your generator system or your emergency power supply system. One of the solutions that we are recommending to many of our critical power customers in the healthcare and data center industry is Schneider Electric's Power Monitoring Expert and specifically the generator performance module. This particular module, when combined with the Schneider Electric EPMS system, allows the recording of the EPSS test automatically. It uses a standard methodology and can also support software initiation of the test. The nice thing about it is all of the documentation required for compliance reporting is automatically generated and this can be saved or emailed to the appropriate locations within your organization. So what is involved in setting up a automated testing and reporting system? The following single line diagram shows a typical emergency power supply system. You've got your normal source and your emergency source, and both sources are connected to automatic transfer switches, which are supplying power to typically three categories of loads. You have life safety branches, critical branches, and equipment branches. In order to implement the Schneider Electric Generator Performance Module, it requires the installation of sub-metering at both your generators and your automatic transfer switches. And those sub-meters serve several purposes. Number one, they sub-meter or they provide analog information related to the power that's being generated. And they also capture information on the transfer switches and the loads that are being supplied through the transfer switches. The, the submeters also provide uh, inputs to the system so they can record certain statuses like the generator is running, that it's supplying power to the load, that the transfer switch is in emergency. Another benefit of having submetering at the generator is within the generator performance module, we can use the auxiliary voltage input of the submeter to capture the voltage of the starter batteries. And this is important, and a few slides you'll see why. So what's required to run a generator test report? So certainly, in order to conduct a test, there are a couple of different methodologies. First is that you can initiate a test at your automatic transfer switch. So typically there's a test initiation button that can be used at the automatic transfer switch that will initiate a test. So again, it will send a signal to the generator letting it know that a test should be initiated. 
So another way in order to initiate a generator test is at the generator using the run contact or the run input at the generator. Yet a third way is initiating your test through software. And if you have the generator performance module that is incorporated into the Schneider Electric Power Monitoring Expert, this is certainly an option that can be used should you choose to want to initiate your tests remotely via software. A fourth way that tests can be generated and is often overlooked is if you run your generator because of a real life condition. So let's say that you have a loss of normal power and the generator does run as it's um, designed to do. Well, if it runs and it runs for 30% of the nameplate, for over 30 minutes and it meets the qualifications of being no less than 20 days since the last generator test and no more than 40 days, then that event or that particular instance in which the generator performed can qualify as a test uh, case or as a uh, performance test for your generator. The nice thing about having an automated system for recording your generator tests is that even though you may not have had the personnel with the stopwatch and the clipboard at the generator, if your uh, generator performance module is in place, it automatically recorded the event and it will actually validate that test and let you know that you've got that test already covered for that particular month or that one of those 12 periods throughout the year. So again, one of the benefits of having this performance module is a lot of the heavy lifting is done for you. The reports are built in and they supply all the necessary information that you would turn over to JCO or your AHJ. Um, and so from that perspective, these reports are automatically saved. They can also be emailed to the appropriate personnel and they can be brought up for inspection when you have an audit by one of the AHJs. So again, um, a very automated and organized manner in which to conduct your uh, reporting portion of testing. So just an example of some of the um, details that are provided within the report. All the reports provide you with a pass-fail indication they also give you a graphical display to show you the level at which the generator ran. The trend also shows you um, the duration as well as the fact that you have exceeded the minimum requirement for the 30% of the nameplate. In addition, the report will show you interval data and showing you min, maxes, and averages for the different types of parameters or values recorded during the test. And these could be not only just the power, but also showing you phase currents and phase voltages, as well as apparent power. Again, one of the primary reasons that um, having an automated means for not only conducting your testing, but reporting your testing is that you can incorporate some other diagnostics that will help mitigate the potential failure of your generator to start when it's needed. The list on this slide shows you the top nine reasons why a generator fails to start. And as you can see, similar to, to other engines that are started based on battery, the number one reason is battery failure. Either the battery doesn't have enough um, cranking amps, cold cranking amps, or the battery isn't charged. One of the benefits of having the generator performance module as part of your Schneider Electric Power Monitoring Expert System is it has the capability to trend voltage and also has the ability to warn you if that battery voltage is trending lower and therefore may be requiring some attention in terms of a problem with the charger or a problem with the battery itself requiring perhaps replacement.
Another great benefit of having the generator performance module is it has an event summary. So anything that's being monitored through the inputs of the submeter that's associated with the generator or the automatic transfer switches is getting automatically recorded in timestamp. So you've always got access to a sequence of events that shows you down to a tenth of a second what's happening within your emergency power supply system. So again, a lot of these can, um, can be helpful when you're trying to root cause or troubleshoot what happened during a test or even what might have happened during a normal exercise where the emergency power supply system was called on to start due to a disruption of normal service. As I mentioned earlier, the generator performance module not only provides information on your generator and your generator battery system, it also provides details on the testing associated with your automatic transfer switches. And again, um, your automatic transfer switches have information related to A, the transfer time, so how long it took to transfer from uh, once normal power was detected as being unavailable to when emergency power supply system was available, and also it records information on how long you were on emergency power supply. So again, um, having these details readily available, whether it be for a test scenario or whether it be to root cause or understand what happened when you had a disruption within your emergency power supply system, is of great benefit to most of our customers. And it's one of the reasons why we're seeing, again, if, you know, the benefit is not only saving time or reducing the amount of workload that um, maintenance personnel are required to, to take on when they engage in manual testing, but it's also learning a little bit more about your emergency power supply system and potentially identifying um, premature failure or potential problems within your emergency power supply system. This is an example of an ATS and generator event summary. There's an obvious error that when you examine this sequence of events that can be detected, but without this type of automated reporting, it would be hard to catch that this problem occurred. Some of you may notice this, but I'll go ahead and, and highlight where the error was. So if you look at the first four records, you'll see that the same automatic transfer switch was initiated with the test button four times in a row. And what you'll find is that, so as you can see, within that time frame from 5.53 and 15 seconds a.m. down to 44, there were three times where the test was initiated, but it wasn't until the fourth test where the generator actually started. And what this is indicative of is that the system was in manual mode. That means that the operator hit the test switch at the automatic transfer switch, but the generator failed to start. And it failed to start because at the generator itself, the generator was not in automatic mode. It was in manual mode. And that could have been in manual mode for several reasons. Perhaps there was some previous testing done using the generator and uh, there was a failure to put it back into automatic mode. But again, these types of information would allow an owner to identify perhaps some procedural changes or maybe they need to look at, there should have been an NFPA 110 level one alert or an indication and audible associated with the fact that the um, emergency control system was not in automatic mode. But again, having a system that automatically records these events and brings them into an um, area or to a report that can be inspected can allow you to uh, identify opportunities within your operations and maintenance um, to perhaps improve some of your procedures. The following is a, a detail of a generator load summary that is a standard part of the reporting associated with the generator performance module. Again, it's very uh, easy to understand. You can easily see where the generator was started. 
somewhere around 1.15 a.m. You can see that based on this particular generator that the 30% of nameplate is about 150 uh, kilowatts and that this test clearly ran above 150 kilowatts and that based on starting around 115 and exceeding the nameplate certainly well prior to 120 and then the test ending somewhere after 156 that the uh, 30 minute requirement was met and that the test status was a pass. So certainly based on this you'll see again you, you'll have the generator name this generator was 500 kilowatts start time stop time and then you can see the results of the test similarly um, one of the requirements of nfpa is monitoring the minimum exhaust gas temperature so in order to prevent wet stacking which could potentially affect the performance of the generator. It can have an impact on the longevity of certain components of the generator. There's typically a requirement to, um, in addition to looking at the nameplate or that also the minimum exhaust gas temperature be met. Now this is um, a hard and fast requirement. As long as you're meeting the 30% nameplate and 30 minutes, um, looking at the exhaust gas temperature is an optional. Um, however, it should be noted that as part of the generated performance module, that system is automatically set up so that if you use the analog inputs on your submeter at the generator for bringing in the exhaust gas temperature, the tests associated with the generated performance module will validate whether your generator passed that requirement during the test. So in this case, you'll see very similar to the load uh, profile graph, you have a exhaust gas summary which shows again based on a start time of 101 a.m. and a stop time of 206 that this particular generator which had a minimum exhaust gas temperature of 800 degrees Fahrenheit ran above that for uh, majority of the tests and therefore pass the requirements as stated in NFPA 110. So again, just in closing, I'd like to say that, you know, the benefit of the generator performance module is not just that it's sitting there and watching and recording the tests and therefore potentially saving your personnel's time for other activities related to the electrical distribution system or the emergency power supply system, but that it can serve as yet another diagnostic tool for uh, increasing the longevity, increasing the performance, and also proactively identifying potential preventative maintenance that might need to occur on the generator ahead of scheduled maintenance. So again, it's a, it's a great tool for your electricians or your mechanics in order uh, to understand how the generator and the emergency power supply system is performing. Thank you for joining us today for today's webinar on automating the testing and reporting of emergency power supply systems. My information is on the current slide. Should you have any questions, please feel to reach out to me and I'll be happy to help you in any way that we can. Thank you.